Uh, I'm Isaac Wells, the Assistant Director of Professional Learning with the Core Collaborative. Uh, we are so glad to have all of you joining us today. Uh, these masterclass uh, series webinars are one piece of our kind of larger umbrella of uh, what we call the Core Contributes, which is just a way we can give back. So if you check out www.thecorecontributes.com, uh, you can go ahead and download a reflection journal that will let you kind of keep track of your thoughts and even better get some credit, especially for those of you who are on <laughs> your last day of school doing some professional learning. Let's get you some credit for that. Uh, I'm so pumped to have Michael on with us tonight. As I said, uh, we've just been really getting to know each other and found out that among other things, we have four-year-olds in common. <laughs> uh, so that's been fun. Uh, for those of you who don't know him, he currently is a superintendent uh, of the Ross uh, School District, and he's done just about everything you can do in education. He's been a teacher, uh, a coach, and ed leader in that uh, way. He's a consultant now. He's worked as a principal. Uh, he's worked uh, in the nonprofit sector as well as uh, for public schools. Uh, but today, we're really going to focus on his passion for making learning authentic and real and engaging for students without sacrificing any of the rigor that sometimes can be lost when we make that shift from very traditional learning to uh, more problem-based uh, uh, learning. And so I don't want to take up any of his great time sharing with you, so I'm going to hand it right over to Michael. Uh, on this next slide, you'll see an awesome book that I recommend you pick up. I'm going to throw a link in the comments right now. Uh, I love this book. I think you will too. And you can, of course, join Michael on Twitter. Uh, you can see his handle right there. And without further ado, take it away. Great. Thanks, Isaac. And it's, uh, it's uh, great to have everybody here. So thanks for being here tonight. And as you have questions, just throw those up on the chat. And um, as we go, um, I'll stop every once in a while and, and check in with Isaac to, mm -hmm. to see where we are and, and try to answer some of those questions. So I, I thought I'd start with the project that I designed a few years ago. This is, um, well, if, if, I want you to just take a second and think about where you think this might be. Um, this is actually about two hours north of San Francisco. This is a Russian fort. So this was a Russian fort that was built to actually harvest sea otters. So if you actually look on the, the, the top of that screen, there's a huge kelp forest that kind of exists right underneath the Pacific, or right underneath the water there. And these sea otters would just be, would be living out here. The Russians actually enslaved the Alas Alaskans and then brought them out and hunted these sea otters. Now I thought this would be a really great project. A few years ago, I proposed to my students, I said, imagine the United States and the Russian government wanted to work together and they wanted to re-establish or reintroduce the sea otters into this particular part of the Pacific Ocean because there aren't many sea otters that actually exist here. We see a few down in Monterey, um, but those are being re-established re down there. But up here, we don't have any of those sea otters because they were decimated for the fur trade uh, when the Russians were here. This is actually the, the furthest south we've ever seen a Russian Orthodoxy church uh, that's built within this fort. Now, one of the things about this project is that it was, there was some relevance behind it. The kids were excited. The kids could go out, we could do a field trip. But when you ask the kids, hey, what are you learning about? They were like, we're learning about sea otters. And so the challenge there is that there are no standards in the California state standards and science or the next gen standards on sea otters. There's not, I will learn about sea otters. And so memory is the residue of thought. That means what kids think about goes into their long-term memory. And so the kids are like, this is amazing. And we're learning about sea otters and the Russians. And well, we're talking about the Russians on TV right now. And so all these things are going on, but the kids actually aren't thinking about their learning. They're actually not thinking about the core content that I'm actually trying to get them to learn. See, one of the things we're trying to develop with students is their ability to actually learn core content and then apply it to real world situations. And so what I'm really trying to get students to understand is to understand food chains, to understand food webs. So like what happens when you lose a species? What happens if you reintroduce a species into an ecosystem? What actually happens to all of the animals and plants within this particular area? But the kids weren't thinking about that. And ultimately what I want them to do is not only understand food chains and food webs in this situation, but actually to take that content and apply it into another situation, such as, so last year in April, I was in Africa. 
and I'm on this and I'm on this really cool Range Rover with all of these kids and we're looking at these two rhinos. Now the rhino on the far left, the big one is named Tundi. Tundi is the first rhino that was ever poached and survived. And the baby right, right there, her name is Justice and Justice was born, um, was born three weeks prior to this picture. They named her Justice because um, that was the same day that the poachers were imprisoned. So I'm listening to this great story and I'm asking the kids, hey, what are we learning about? They're like, rhinos. Which again, they're actually not learning about rhinos. Ultimately, what I want children to do and students to do is to be able to take this concept like food chains and food webs and say, hey, we could apply it into this situation like the sea otters in the North Pacific Ocean. We could also apply it with rhinos or with the ecosystem out in South Africa or Mozambique. And the ability to be able to transfer core content knowledge is essential. Yet what often happens when we do problem and project-based learning is one, we build a project around relevance, around one situation. We wow kids, we're like, look at this cool thing that's going on. The kids are like, yay, this thing is really cool. And then we're like, what are we learning about? And they're like, we don't know, but we're gonna build a really cool diorama for you, <laughs> right? So they build a cool PowerPoint, they build a diorama and they've got a cool video and they're like, look at these like, you know, transitions I can make in the movies. And you're like, that's a pretty cool transition. Yet, I don't think you know what you're talking about. And so we get this sneaking suspicion for many of us on this call who have done either done PBL or you're like, I have never really wanted to do it because you're worried that the kids will actually go through this and actually not learn some of the things you want them to learn. And so the idea is how do you strike a balance? How do you give kids these really cool opportunities and experiences and to see real life situations and at the same time be able to apply that into multiple situations. We want students to understand what's going on right now with COVID-19 and apply their learning of viruses, of microorganisms, of why soap works, all of these things that we're trying to study in biology and chemistry or in English language arts or mathematics, whatever our core content area is, we want to apply that. But we need to make sure students can actually see the content and then apply it into multiple situations. And so what we're going to look at is we're going to look at a little bit of the research. We're going to talk about just a few practices to just dive into. Why is project-based learning have a mixed, a checkered past? And why would I even be talking about the ability to use it as a vehicle to help with rigor and relevance? So we'll, that's where we're going to kind of jump into um, this afternoon, so, or this evening. So I wanna share this, this image with you that, that I really like, and it helps me think about the balance between um, the types of learning that we want from kids. So often I'll ask, when I have a group of people in a room, I'll ask them like, which one of these do you think really defines what we want in a learner? And almost everyone picks the person that's digging the big hole down to the light bulbs. They're like, you, you need to have deliberate practice, you need to focus, you need to develop core content, like that's what we need to do. And then you have others that look at this one on the far right and say, well, actually, I just want kids to have some experiences, a broad range of experiences, and that that's really what we want in learning. And what I would say is the answer to actually to which one is better is yes. It's both. <laughs> like, we actually want students to develop depth of knowledge and range of experiences. I can see across multiple situations. And I have a depth of knowledge that I can actually use in more than one situation. And often we pick one or the other. So often in project-based learning, we pick range. We give kids lots of cool experiences, lots of products. They get to work in groups. They get to do all these things. And again, they come out with a hollow or shallow understanding, what research calls impoverished deep learning. And they actually lack this core content knowledge. And on the flip side, we can have classrooms where kids learn a lot of things, but then you give them a real world problem and they're like, I don't know what to do. Can you tell me what to do? And so we, let's look at a little bit of the research and then figure out, all right, how do you bring both of these ideas together where you have depth and breadth in terms of learning and what those things mean? So I'm gonna put a little, I'm gonna put some language behind some of this. So I, I, I use this with, um, Five years ago, I went from, I, don't, I spent most of my career in high school, and five years ago, I went into elementary school, and so, uh, which I love. I mean, it's absolutely amazing. And we've been looking at some images to help students be able to actually talk about their learning. And so we've used images like the snorkeler, the scuba diver, and the astronaut, which have really helped students understand 
levels of learning. So some of you might be like, I love blooms, I love DOK levels. And my argument tonight is it, those things are fine, but they're not very helpful for kids. Like you're never gonna see a kid go to another kid and say, hey, are you a DOK three? Right, like the, 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 or hey, are you, and are you analyzing the right way? I mean, those are really challenging conversations for adults to have. But really what we wanna give kids is a very simple typology that they can talk about. Surface, I know things. So that's why they're at the surface of the water. They, they know a couple things, they're looking around, they're like, oh, that's a fish. Deep is I, I actually can make meaning, I can relate ideas. And transfer is I can take those ideas and I can apply them into a new situation. So think of surface and deep as depth, right? I'm getting that depth of understanding and transfer being breadth and application. And so that's what we're gonna look at because it's really important as you talk about methodologies of where does PBL sit within these methodologies because what we're gonna find out is that really it's a Kenny Rogers model. You gotta know when to hold them and know when to fold them. There's good places for PBL and then there's some places where I'd be like, I, 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 would, I would strongly encourage you to not try to fit a square peg in a round hole. Not only is it gonna make you frustrated and tired, uh, it also doesn't have that much of an effect size on student learning. And so we're going to look at that a little bit and then I'll, I'll pause and, and get some questions. So let's look at, let's go back to that example with the, uh, with the sea otters or the rhinos. And, and you can see here like surface deep transfer. So surface is I can define a food web and a food chain. So kids are like, all right, I know what those things are. Deep is I can actually relate them. Okay. So food chains or food webs are like an amalgam of all of these different food chains and they can be in the water, they can be in, you know, different biomes. And then transfer is I can actually apply that into the real world. Like what happens if these um, ferrets keep eating the eggs of the kiwi? You know, what happens if you introduce the, a non-native species into some place? What happens if the gray wolf comes back? Whatever, it doesn't really matter what context. But that's what transfer is all about. Rigor is the equal intensity of all three of these things. So one is not more important than the other. So if someone's like, I'm on team surface, um, okay, or uh, I'm on team transfer, like I just want kids to apply. Well, it's really hard to apply something you don't understand. Like you can't critically think about something you don't have any knowledge about. It's really hard to critically think about calculus if you don't know anything about calculus. It's really hard to critically think about how do you address the issue of poaching uh, if you don't know anything about poaching or government policy or uh, socio socioeconomic pressures. Uh, all of those types of things I think are really important. So. One thing to keep in mind is that rigor is the equal intensity of all of these. They're all critical. Um, often in inquiry, when we think about what kind of questions we want students to ask, this is a way of thinking about those levels in terms of the questions kids often ask. What is the multiplication of fractions? How do I multiply fractions? That would be surface. This would be about procedural fluency, understanding what I'm actually doing. Deep is why. Why can I multiply it this way? Why does, the, why does the equation look this way? Why can I use this visual representation? It's really getting to a deeper understanding of the underlying principles behind what I'm doing and why I'm doing what I'm doing. Transfer is when do you use the multiplication of fractions versus dividing versus adding versus other orders of operation? Where would you use the multiplication of fractions? Should we use the multiplication of fractions in this situation, right? Like, the, and so, all three of these things are critical for students in terms of their learning, that they need to learn surface, they need to learn deep, and they need to learn transfer. As we continue to move forward, we want to think about from the research what works best. So when we think about those three levels of learning, surface, deep, and transfer, what really makes the impact on student learning? And we actually have, we have some ideas behind this. So Professor John Hattie, spent some time, he, and, well, a lot of time, he spent almost 20 years investigating what works in education. So Professor Hattie was a music teacher, went, got his PhD, studied uh, psychometric, psychometrics. He then decided to do an analysis of everything in education, what we call a synthesis of meta-analysis. So he did a study of studies that studied studies, <laughs> and he was trying to figure out what works in education and does everything work? Because, I mean, you and I both know when we go onto Twitter, we constantly are seeing like, hey, this works. Hey, this works. Hey, this works. This works for me. Hey, this works. And it's kind of a question of like, is it, is it true? Does, does everything really work? And Professor Hattie was like, yeah, yeah, pretty much. Pretty much everything works. So that's exciting. Um, 
So if almost everything works, and we're not gonna get into all of the literature around Professor Hattie's visible learning tonight, but I would strongly encourage you if you're unfamiliar to take a look at that, is that if 95%, 98% of everything in education works, then we need to come up with a filter of, well, then what are those things that work best? And so he created this, this scheme, if you will, this dial. And you can see that this blue zone is what we would represent as more than one year's growth in one year's time. Now those numbers up on the top are effect sizes. That's the way in which we calculate growth in using meta-analyses. And so that 0.4 number for tonight, we're gonna to call the hinge point. These things that sit in that blue zone have a substantial effect on student learning. Again, things below that from a 0.00 to 0.4 do show growth. Students are growing. It is a question of, but what are those things above the 0.4 and what's the story behind some of those things? And so that's what Professor Hattie did in his original study in 2009 when he published it. So let's take, but what's interesting is that 90% of that study was done at surface, looking at surface level learning for students. So when you go back and you read the original visible learning study and you see all these effect sizes, one of the most interesting things is it's telling you these are the things that work at a really, really high level when students are learning basic facts, knowledge, like core content, like what is a food web? What is a food chain? How do you calculate? How do you, how do you add these things? How do you subtract these things? Um, we want to take a look at, okay, well, what are those things? And then what are those things that have a substantial effect on that deep to transfer level? What, what really makes a difference, which, which didn't come out in 2009, but it did come out in 2016 uh, when he published that. But let's take a look at the surface and then we'll get to the deep and transfer. I know this is exciting. I'm excited too. Who doesn't want to talk about research at, uh, <laughs> uh, on the last day of school? But maybe, maybe I'll pause for just a second. Isaac, what, what do we got? What am I missing? I'm getting ahead of myself. No, this is great. And I just want to say everybody who's on, when you have thoughts, questions, uh, throw those in the chat so we can see uh, or put them in. Uh, and I would love for people to share anything that's kind of an aha moment for them. Like I've put a couple in, your definition of rigor was the most clear <laughs> I've ever heard. And I'm someone who's defined it about 10 million times. Uh, so I love that. Uh, but yeah, the more you guys give us, uh, the more we can respond uh, directly to you uh, in your situation. Okay. Okay, let's, uh, let's keep going and then I'll, I'll, I'll pause it here in just a little bit. So, mm -hmm. so let's talk about surface level knowledge, why it's so important and, and, and what makes a huge impact. So there was, remember, remember when we could go to baseball games? So there was, um, <laughs> so there was a study that was done where they took students in, in I think third or fourth grade. One group of students were in the 90, like fifth percentile in reading comprehension and one group was in like the 30th percent reading comprehension. And they had, a little, they had a little baseball diamond cut out and they had little figurines and they had to read a passage. And the passage was something like the player hit a double, uh, the person that was sitting on third base ran, uh, or the person on first base ran to third and was out. Um, and then they asked, the, they asked the two groups, move the figurines based on what you saw and, or what you read. And what was interesting is that it did not matter your reading comprehension skills. It only mattered if you had knowledge of baseball. And if you don't believe me, for those of you who, who, um, who have not been to Australia or don't know cricket, type in the <laughs> Sydney Herald and type in just anything about a cricket match and read it because everyone on this call has great reading comprehension skills and you're gonna read that and you're gonna say, I have no earthly idea what they're talking about. So what does this mean? Well, Daniel Willingham at the University of Virginia wrote a book called Why Don't Students Like School? And one of the things he said is facts precede skill. That if you don't have core knowledge, that Velcro to attach new ideas, bringing new skills in actually doesn't help kids that much. Giving kids new skills to say, this is a great skill for critical thinking. This is a great skill to collaborate. This is why one of the big myths, big myths of PBL is put kids in groups of four. Well, if you put kids in groups of four to talk about a project and they don't know any of the content, what are they gonna talk about? I know what they're gonna talk about. They're gonna create roles where someone's gonna be the leader, whatever that is. Someone's gonna do the PowerPoint. Someone's gonna be the encourager. That was my favorite role where I'm like, everyone's doing great. 
<laughs> right? Keep it up, guys. Good work. Right? And, 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 these, and these are the types of roles where they divide and conquer and try to build really great products without any core content. And so we've, when we look at the analysis of like those things that make this huge impact on student learning, especially from that surface to deep level, if you see those things in the blue zone, they have such a high effect. So it's seeking help from peers, students giving each other accurate feedback when they have enough core content knowledge. Teacher clarity is actually a misnomer. It's not the teacher being clear, it's the student being clear on what the teachers expect. Like I've got a real clear sense of what the teacher wants from me. That there are classroom discussions where kids are talking with one another about, well, I think it's this versus I think it's this. So it's not that you have a group, it's that when the groups come together, that they're really using these things in the blue zone to have a really high effect. And one of the only ways they can do that is to have core content knowledge. To actually say, okay, I think I actually now understand these definitions. I know how to calculate these things. And I'm just gonna, and, and I know this is a lot of data right up here, but I wanna, I wanna walk through what this means in terms of PBL. If you look at the effect size of PBL as a method, as a method and this is in that 2009 study, the effect size of PBL has an effect size of, of about half of what we want, which means that if you were to do wall-to-wall -wall project and problem-based learning in your school with kids, the research would say they're probably gonna get about a half a year's growth in one year's time. So that would mean if you have a third grader and they get done with third grade and they start fourth grade, they will be about halfway through third grade. So this is a problem and this is a challenge. And we need to take a look at why that would be the case. Well. Let's look at direct instruction. So direct instruction, which for those of you who really like PBL, you're like, how can you have direct instruction at PBL? These two things can't be together. It's like lamb and tuna fish, right? Like this doesn't work. Well, actually, when you look at surface to deep, direct instruction is a really helpful methodology. It, it, and, and, I, and I don't just mean like we just lecture, like what I'm doing now. I mean like actually like giving kids a hook, providing you know, modeling, doing guided practice, doing independent practice, checking in. Those things from surface to deep, direct instruction, so impactful, it is incredibly helpful. And often when we go to project-based learning, we're like, this methodology doesn't align with the philosophy of constructivism. And I would say, let's let go of philosophies and let's look at what's gonna be the best way to move the needle for kids. And I would say surface to deep, direct instruction is one of those strategies that really, really helps move kids to starting to make really strong relationships. But that starts to change as we go into transfer. So what, let's look at one other study. At Stanford University, there were two, they lo researchers love to put two class, use two yeah. classrooms, I don't know why. I mean, oh, I do know why, but anyways, they have two classrooms. And so they have one classroom, or both classrooms get the same problem. So here's the problem. You have a democratic country, it's right next to an autocracy. And you have to provide some guidance to this democratic country of what they should do because the, this autocratic country is encroaching on them in some way, shape, or form. So these are all graduate students. They, they, they have a wealth of knowledge, right? A lot of that surface and deep level knowledge. And they get into the room um, and they start talking about it. And the, and the professor goes into one room and says, I want to give you a couple of other things to, to know. The president of this democratic country is going to meet in the Winston Churchill room. Um, they're going to meet with the president of the United States. He comes from New York. And we just found out that there are some refugees that are in boxcars. In the other room, they say something like this. Uh, they're going to meet in the Nixon room. Um, the president of the United States comes from Texas. And they're finding that some of the refugees are, are in boats. Now, they come out of this room an hour later. And the group that heard the part about Winston Churchill and New York said, we should go to war. And this group that said, um, you know, we're going to meet in the Nixon room, Texas, they said we need to find a diplomatic solution. And the reason why is because they got an analogy about World War II or an analogy of the Vietnam War and they could not step out of that analogy. They could not find range and say, what else should we be thinking about besides just the clues the professor gave us? And so they lacked breadth. They had tons of knowledge, but they didn't have breadth. And this is where we start seeing problem and project-based learning becoming incredibly important when we think about rigor. Because if we, if we keep teaching kids this and saying 10,000 hours, do 10,000 hours of this, and they're like 10,000 hours. The problem is, is when you start saying, hey, 
what happens if there's a pandemic? They're like, I don't know. Yeah. Right. And we need people that can actually go like this and go like this. Well, let's use these skills. And so we have to pivot between what's right for surface and deep and what's right for transfer. And so here you can see that the, that project based learning from that deep to transfer changes the game. And this is one of the best methodologies that enable us to actually get kids to that level. But where PBL has a major deficit is when we say, well, the surface stuff doesn't matter or because I'm doing project based learning, we don't need to do direct instruction. And that is such an essential piece for us. So you can see here the change from surface to deep to deep to transfer in terms of the effect size. And it's the inverse of direct instruction. So how would we design a project? Well, one of the things that I think is really important in a project is to think of like four phases of a project where part one or phase one is you would start students with some transfer level problem. So you'd start them with the sea otter problem. You'd start them with, there's a thing going on with the rhinos. You'd start them with, we've got this really interesting math problem, or we need to write an argumentative essay about this situation. That's where we would launch them on day one. You'd get on a Zoom call, the students would be there and you're like, we got a problem. And they'd be like, oh, okay. And now the next part of that would be, I'm gonna teach you some core content. And that's where you flip in the direct instruction, you flip in using jigsaws, you flip in having them do some reading, you flip into actually some of the things that we, we know how to do outside of inquiry and say, I'm gonna embed this in, there's the balance. And then you go into that deeper level work and then you come back out at the end and say, okay, knowing that we learned this, let's go back and try to solve that problem. And then you give them a new problem. So they're like, oh, you solved the Seattle problem, great. Now let's look at the rhinos. All right, now let's look at this situation. And can kids transfer and say, oh, okay, so now I gotta solve this problem. Now, what does instruction look like without project-based learning? Well, take out phase one and take out phase four, and you've got most instruction. We teach the surface stuff. Sometimes we get into some classroom discussions and have kids do a concept map and actually do some open responses and say, you know, this is what this means, this is why this is important. Um, but we usually take out one and four and don't provide the bookends to a real challenging problem and at the end. All right, I'll just stop for just a couple minutes there. Isaac, any, any questions uh, you wanna throw out? Uh, well, a couple things have come up. One is just people yeah. appreciating how clear you are uh, oh. and how much understanding you're bringing to people about what does it really mean to go deep? What does it mean to transfer and how important that surface learning is uh, plus, uh, we just got a comment uh, that they appreciate this honest criticism of PBL. Mm. They're just saying it's perfect, it's going to get us there. So then when we start, we have reasonable expectations and we don't have that feeling I've had where you think you're doing the right thing. And then a week later, six weeks later, a unit or a year later, <laughs> you don't get the results you expect. Right. Uh, and I wonder as we're going, and I know you've got some more examples coming up, but if you can kind of speak to, we've had a, a couple of rumblings about like, okay, so I've started some of this in my situation, you know, over the last year, over the last 10 years, how does this live in the virtual world? Yeah, that's a, that's a really great question. Um, you know, I, th I think in terms of the virtual world, if, if I was to take these four phases, I think that what phase one would look like for me is that I would probably send them some kind of event up front to do some previewing or some reading. So it might be, so let me give an example that I just mm -hmm. uh, ran a few months ago. So again, and, I, and I'm, I'm giving you my example and it's gonna be in science and mathematics because that's who I am um, as a teacher, but I will, I will try to share some, some other examples as we go. So I wanted to do a project that students learned about um, biology, but also learned about government. And so I sent something out to students and I said, and I, I gave a certain group of students a couple of articles to read about waste. I gave another group of students something to read about water. I gave uh, water pollution. I gave another group something about climate change. And I gave another group um, some ones about uh, some articles about uh, food and food racism, essentially. Like where do we actually place food 
based on the socioeconomic status of certain communities. Now, none of the students knew that they weren't all reading the same article. I just sent some different ones to the students. Then I brought them all onto a Zoom call and I asked different students, hey, what did you read? What did you learn from that? And so then what happened is kids started to notice like, hey, they read something different. And I'm like, yep, yeah, now I'm gonna put you into a, into a breakout room like on Zoom and I'm gonna put you into groups where each of you has a different, uh, looked at a different article and I want you to come up with what you think is our problem. And what was interesting is kids actually came up with a lot of interesting problems about environmental racism and about what we can do about environmental racism. But it wasn't about water pollution or, and it wasn't about food and waste management. It was actually more about environmental racism in general. And then they came back and on Zoom, we started to talk about what is our overall driving question, this question that we wanna to try to solve together versus what's the product I have to do at the end of this, right? So then what I said is I, I said, okay, so the next couple of days, I'm gonna give you a, an assessment on your understanding of government, your understanding of some of these policies and environmental principles I need you to understand. And then I'm gonna schedule you to do Zoom sessions with me based on where you are in terms of your assessment. Sometimes they would be asynchronous. So I'd record myself doing some direct instruction. Sometimes I would just meet with a small group and say, hey, I saw this on your assessment. These are some things we need to work on. And then in the deeper level work, that's where I would bring either the whole class together or small groups together and do a protocol, a discussion protocol with students on trying to relate some of these core principles together. And then in the transfer, their presentations, I would assign certain groups to come in. So what would happen is I would say, these three groups of three or four students are gonna come in, one group is gonna present, and then we're gonna do a feedback protocol with those students on their presentation. So not all the students were sitting there at once, that'd be probably boring for all of the kids, but a couple of groups come together to give that kind of feedback. And I will say that I don't put kids into groups usually until the end of phase three. So that doesn't mean they don't collaborate, but I don't put kids into groups until they actually know, until they have something to talk about. Other than that, it's going to be, all right, you do PowerPoint slide one, two, three, I'll do four, five, six, we'll get this thing squared away and we'll present it to the teacher and we'll be done. I'm like, no, 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 yeah, yeah. I'm not going to do that. So that's one example for Isaac. I love it. And I really hear that focus on the question throughout. You keep coming back to why are we doing this? What are we investigating? And it sounds a bit like the accordion where you come in together and focus and then you spread out and learn and learn and learn and then come back. And I love that mix between the groups. Uh, and then uh, somebody saying like great examples in the book uh, and, and uh, rigorous PBL by design. And then also that what you're describing is really parts of that are like an expert jigsaw to take jigsaw and go farther and go deeper with it. Uh, and so we invite anybody out there on Facebook or on Zoom, share some of your ideas and examples, favorite problems or projects that you've dug into with kids and some of your tips and tricks. Uh, and we'll keep going, but uh, I'll, I'll feed you things as they pop up. Great. Thanks, Isaac. Thanks for that question. That was, that was a good one. Keep me on my toes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so let's talk about a few myths. I've, I've, I've shared a few of them, but I, I think mm -hmm. these are important to, um, and I think this is actually like, like we had actually pushed out that we're going to talk about this. Yeah, so yeah, let's, uh -huh. let's talk about a few. Yeah, yeah. Um, so one of the things, you know, when I, when I first learned project-based learning, I was told this is the only way to do it. It's a panacea. And, you know, we always find out that, you know, nothing stands the test of kids. As soon as you come into the classroom, you're like, I might have to change things. And one of the things that there was this myth that if you build a perfect project, then it's going to be great. It's kind of like the field of dreams. If you build it, they will come. It's like, and that is just not true. Like I spent, I don't know, 50, 60 hours designing a project. And if you go onto a lot of websites with a lot of, you know, organizations that build projects, they look amazing, but they also look like a dissertation. It's like, holy cow, like who had time to build this thing? And then what happens is you build it and then you go in on the first day and some of the kids are like, I don't understand. And you actually are driving home and start, or you get off the Zoom call and you're like, I don't think this is the right project, but I just spent a hundred hours on it. So we're going through this thing, right? It's like going on a bear hunt. We're going through it. Yeah. And um, so my suggestion is you, you go through prototypes, you, you design a problem, you, you, you do some of the basics of what a project should look like. 
And then you recreate and refine with kids. And then you're like, all right, that part worked, scribble that in, all right, that part didn't work, scratch that out. And then the next time you roll it with kids, it gets better and it gets better. I mean, to me, someone who says, look, I've designed a project that's been tested seven or eight times versus I have this really great project that I framed on my wall. It, no one's done it yet, but it looks great. I would go with the person that's like, I've actually run this several times. And so I think one of the big myths is that we have to design a perfect project and it's, there's just no such thing. And, and I, for one, as, a, as an educator, don't wanna spend a lot of time um, trying to implement this, the, these really dense curriculum documents, but that's just me. So I think that's a myth. Um, and like in the rigorous PBL, you see there's like just a, a very simple like one page template. And when we've done a lot of PD around that, it's like, that's it. And I'm like, that's it. So utilize those types of things, go in, because the, the magic of all of this is actually when you're there with kids. It's, it's not usually when you're out, you know, doing the scribbling and the designing. So that's, that's one key myth I would throw out. The other is this idea that we're guides on the side, right? Like, I, I remember this, it was like, Michael, you're either a sage on the stage or you're a guide on the side. Now, I find dichotomies completely lazy. I, I don't believe in them. The only thing I actually believe in is that the only dichotomy I actually believe in is you either put your shopping carts away or don't. Other than that, there aren't really that many <laughs> dichotomies that are out there. And, um, and so, so I was told, hey, Michael, so when you're teaching math, um, just be the guy on the side. Like you give them the problem, you have put them into groups, you've designed a really great project, and then they'll figure out um, you know, linear equations or logarithms. <laughs> okay. That's not true. Like they actually need me. Um, they need me a lot, actually. Not, not, I mean, for moral support, but also to show them different ways of thinking about it. And I was trained in math. I was trained in bio and science. And so I, I need to support them in that. And so the, the truth of the matter is that there are some times where you need to be a guide on the side, but there's some times where you need to be like, let me walk you through it. And I think there's just this myth and there's this fear that we have to let go of and not share what we have to offer. And I would say we should share what we have to offer and balance that with, let's give kids some room to do that wobbling. We want that cognitive wobble. And, and it's always that dance. And that's where the art and science and craftsmanship of teaching comes in. But I would just say, if you're looking at doing PBL, I would stay away from this myth because I think that eventually it gets us to a place where we start to really feel like, I don't think that the kids are getting where I want them to go. And what often happens is then we just throw all this stuff away and revert back to, I'm just gonna teach them the surface stuff and then we can get to the test. And, and I can understand that knee jerk reaction. That's why trying to find the balance between those two, I think is so important. Um, and just to give you a little bit of the research on that, if you look at the difference between activators, that's teachers that are getting um, students prior knowledge, providing direct instruction, giving kids guided practice, checking for understanding, huge effect size, more than one year's growth. The idea of I'm gonna facilitate and make sure all the structures are in the right place, but the kids need to learn it, has a really low effect size. And here's the big reason why. Kids aren't experts, they're novice. And when you're a novice, you need direct support. This is why one of the things we talk about in rigorous PBL is that rubrics are a fantastic tool for experts. We love them, but you give a novice a rubric, it's not super helpful in and of itself. It's actually quite hard. If I gave everyone on this call, and maybe some of you know how to build a, a space shuttle, but I'm like, here's the rubric <laughs> for building a space shuttle. You'd be like, I don't know what to do. Can you show me an example? Can you walk me through it? But if I gave everyone on this call a rubric for effective teaching, you'd probably read that and be like, yeah, yeah, that makes sense because you have all this prior knowledge. And so that's one of the big reasons why there's this big shift. Um, there's this huge philosophy, there's, there's pretty significant philosophy that's laden within PBL that you know, kids should learn by doing, that if we just kind of throw them off and say, okay, you're gonna figure this out, that they'll, that they'll learn, but the, the, and, and there's, every myth has some truth to it and, and some falsehoods. The truth is that you do learn something from, from actual active engagement, but the, but the myth is that everyone learns the same. So it all depends on students' prior knowledge of what they're gonna learn and what they're gonna access by themselves. And so that's again why our role as teachers is so critically important in problem and project-based learning. 
Um, so that's another one. I'll, uh, and then the other one I talked about earlier, I love this one. This is the one that I studied. Dr. Lawler, a professor at USC, called teams the Ferraris of work design. They are high performance, but high maintenance. And when you put adolescents or, or small children into groups of four, um, they, if, if, if it's not structured in the right way and placed in the right place, it becomes a real challenge for teachers. Uh, this was my greatest challenge as a high school teacher with a total student load of 180 students that were all broken up into groups of four. I was constantly having to navigate like, all right, well, this person just broke up with this person, so I can't put them into a group. And then, you know, these particular students are, um, they want to fire the other student and can they fire each other? And now, you know, they, this group doesn't want to present anymore. And then when they do present, it's like a wappable, like one person pops their head up and they're like, they say their part. And then number two says their part. And the other person's like hiding behind the screen. And I'm like, what's going on? And, uh, and, and so to me, I just, the myth is you have to put kids in groups of four. Uh, the truth of the matter is that you could, you should put kids into groups when you think they should be in groups. <laughs> I, I like to do it basically like two or three days before the end of a project. So they've, they've, they've got the problem, they've learned the content. That doesn't mean they don't collaborate with other people, but it's not like the, you know, it's not like the three musketeers, like one for all now, everybody. It's really like the two or three days prior to, all right, we've got this big problem that we're gonna try to solve. We say, all right, we're gonna put you in this group of four. And I like to put kids in groups of four where they disagree with one another. So I kind of find out like, do you agree? Do you disagree? So let's say that they were doing a problem on COVID-19, like, should we have more restrictions or less restrictions? And I've got some kids that are like, let's just all go run outside. And others that are like, we're gonna stay here until there's a vaccine. I'd be like, those are kids I wanna put in the same group together and come up with a solution. You know, let's put MSNBC and Fox News together and be like, yeah. and talk versus they're over here, right? Like, that's what, those are the types of things that I think about in terms of groups. So those, you know, there's millions of myths, but those are a few myths that I think are key for us to be thinking about in terms of our learning. So let me walk through just a couple of um, strategies that I think are really helpful in PBL. And then we'll, um, we'll do some Q&A and then we'll, We'll wrap up. And for some of you, you can start your summer, move from yeah. that 9.5 <laughs> rating to 9.7. So the books actually, I, I, you know, I, I understand that many of, every, every educator is time poor um, and you just don't have a lot of time. And when you do have some time to be like, how can I, you know, support my practice and support my kids? Um, you really need to have just some, some real tangible practices. And so I know that most of this presentation is just provided context. But I really think if we do three things well, whether or not you ever do a project, I think that it really helps kids in terms of the learning and gets that more than one year's growth in one year's time. Number one, make, helping kids be incredibly clear on the content versus the context. You're learning about food chains. You're going to be looking at sea otters, right? You're learning about empathy. You're going to read To Kill a Mockingbird. Um, the di helping kids see that is critical. And whether you're doing a project now or not, anytime you present kids with a task, a context, like if you say, hey, we're gonna be looking at two boats coming at one another, a rate of change problem, or we're gonna write an essay, kids are gonna be thinking about, oh, I need to write a five, you know, it needs to be five paragraphs. This is how it needs to look. And they're not thinking about actually what you care about within the essay which I would assume is more than just five paragraphs. You can write a really great essay in four or six, but it's really about what's inside that essay that you care about. Most novices can't see that. They need to know what are you after? And that's why rubrics are usually not as helpful as successful examples. Showing kids, hey, this is what I'm after, but then saying, so if I say to kids, hey, I got a really great example of what I want you to write. Uh, and it's a scary story. And so they all read it. And I'm like, what do you think we're writing? And they're like, a scary story. I'm like, no, we're not writing a scary story. And they're like, oh, what, what, what do you mean? I'm like, what, what actually are we learning? And then they read it and they read it. And they're like, we're, we're writing a personal narrative, right? But it happens to be a scary story. So what makes a personal narrative so successful? So I work through the example with them and I help them build out the rubric with me. Now, I already know kind of what I'm after, but I'm really helping kids develop clarity. So one way to think about clarity is this. If kids don't struggle and interact with what you expect, they're not clear. And 
And that I think is essential. So one thing with PBL or with any method, I think is let's make sure kids know what we're after in terms of the learning. Number two, challenge. How do we create the right scaffolds at surface, deep, and transfer? If rigor is the equal intensity of all of these things, how do we make sure that we get them the right things at the right time in terms of those three levels? So each person on this call is probably like, all right, I've got some really great things at surface, or I've got some really great things at transfer, but I really struggle with deep. So I'll give you an example. Mathematics, we do really well at surface and transfer. Here's how you solve the problem. Here's how you would apply it to a word problem. But when kids are like, why does that work? You're like, next question. <laughs> like, because often, I mean, that's why the common core is so tough because like my daughter's in fourth grade and she's like, dad, uh, we, need to, we need to use number bonds. And I'm like, what is a number bond? Like, I, I, we never <laughs> do, use those things, which I now understand what they are. But depth, sometimes that's not a place we put as much attention to. In English language arts, sometimes we do, we do really well at surface and deep. Like, here's how you write an essay. You're going to write an essay for me. But then the transfer is like, okay, you wrote an essay about your support of whether or not we should have organic lunches at schools. Now I want you to write the opposite, why we shouldn't. Or the idea that they did one on organic lunches, but then you throw something else out and you say, you know, um, should we change this particular policy in the schools? Like, should schools be able to, you know, should students be able to leave for lunch? Like, you change the context a bit or you change something in it. And then finally, there's a culture that's really centered on learning. So this idea that students are tracking their own learning over time and saying, I know where I'm going, I know where I am, and I know what's next. And so those are really the, the, the three kind of areas that we look at. So Isaac, if it's okay, I'm just gonna go through three kind of yeah. concrete examples and then we'll, we'll go through Q and A and then wrap it up, is that okay? And uh, as you go through them, if you have a couple of opportunities to just share ways that this might be scaffolded, we've had a few people share some of their thoughts and a, a great question about that to generate a little discussion. So maybe one or two of them as you share, just say, hey, here's some ways we might scaffold this for learners who struggle in this way or because this is our first time doing PBL. Yeah, uh, yeah. Awesome, thank you. Totally, you got it. So here's an example. So this is a, this is a school uh, right outside Napa um, and or in, it's in Napa and this is, a, this is a dual immersion school. And so these students, many of these students, are learning English and Spanish for the first time, or learning Spanish for the first time, or English for the first time in this classroom. And what the teacher is doing right here is the teacher is actually asking the students to self-assess an exemplar that she's holding up and saying, where does this exemplar sit at those levels of surface deep and transfer? Is this a transfer level work? At work? Is this surface level work? Is this deep level work? Where is this work? And you can see that the students are actually ranking. And they're saying, oh, well, I think that's out of two, or oh, I think that's out of three, or oh, I think that's out of four, which is the scheme, the, the quantitative scheme or the grading scheme that they use, or assessment scheme that they use for surface deep transfer or not yet to surface. And one way of thinking about this in terms of like scaffolding clarity is once you've identified what you're after for students and you have that rubric in front of you, is to try to find some examples that are at all three of those levels. So what's an example of surface work? What's an example at deep? And what's an example at transfer? And then give those to students and say, I want you to sort these. Which one do you think meets surface? Which one do you think meets deep? Which one do you think meets transfer? Without giving them a rubric. Let them wrestle with it and say, well, this one I think looks better. And this one I don't think because it does two things for you. One, it helps students actually start to develop clarity. And two, it gives you a great pre-assessment. What are kids getting right? What are they missing? What do I need to do a little different? And you can do this with four-year-olds, five-year-olds, 20-year-olds, and that you like throw these types of things out before we ever give them a rubric and say, here's what I'm after. If we're gonna do project-based learning, especially in phase one, when we launch a project, I think don't give them the drive, don't give them the, here's the question, here's the rubric, here's all the things you need to do for me. No, 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 no. This is our chance to actually say, here's a problem, or here's some work that we're gonna be doing together. What do you think makes this piece great? Or what piece do you think is great? And why do you think that's great? And help them build that rubric with you. And then what I love to do is put those examples up on the wall. So imagine on that wall up there, they had three examples of scary stories that was at surface deep and transfer. And then what the teacher says is this, when you write your personal narrative, 
you can write on anything you want except for a scary story. So what that allows the kids to do then is they can see the criteria, but they can't copy the context. And in essence, they have to transfer the learning that they have. So I think those are just a couple brief scaffolds that you can use that, that enable those students to move and develop that level of clarity over time. Um, the, the, in terms of challenge, you know, my thinking on this, when you look at the relationship between direct instruction and project-based learning, is that I believe that one of the best ways to develop challenge for kids is that you start with transfer. You start with a project-based learning approach, give kids some of these challenges up front, and then pivot to some of that direct instruction. So if you already have a unit for next year where you've done a lot of direct instruction or you're not using PBL to begin with, all my, my suggestion as a scaffold is come up with something that would be one day ahead of that, that would launch them into one or two real world problems. Remember, when you give them more than one, they won't fixate on it as much. So give them two problems to say, all right, I'm, I'm gonna teach them about, um, you know, let's, let's say we're gonna, we're gonna teach them about how to write an argumentative essay. So give them two problems to argue about day one, and you might already do some of this and then say, so what do you think is our overall question from this? And then you go in and you actually teach them the way you've been teaching them with the surface stuff and the deep stuff that you are already doing. And then at the end, take an extra day and say, all right, now let's do some kind of culminating event, some kind of presentation. It could be a gallery walk. It could be um, another kind of jigsaw. It could be small groups presenting. It could be people come up and they, they do their group. It could be breakout sessions. Like the, the world is your oyster in terms of how could kids present, like this is what they're thinking. And the, to me, what I'm always looking for students is not that they have a complete crisp product, but actually that they have a, it's kind of messy. They're kind of like, all right, I think it's this. I don't know for sure, but you know, I learned this. And so I think it might apply here because you're giving them problems that we don't have the answer to. Like if I give kids the problem, like what do we do about COVID-19? Like I can't expect kids, well, no, that's not the right answer. Like, <laughs> you know, who am I to say? I don't know. Um, and so that's actually how we want to have the end. And then the final thing I'll throw out, um, I love that, you know, this, this kind of cliffhanger yeah. piece for me is that, <laughs> is that when I do, it is classic. So when I do projects, um, I like to throw in twists and turns at the end. So I want to give you an, just an example. So imagine that we have all of the students in an economics class and they're all about to do a presentation um, on supply and demand. And then the teacher comes in and goes over to a group and says to one group, um, oil prices just dropped. You need to factor that into your, into your presentation. Or imagine that we're in a physics class and the teacher comes over and says, I know that we said that gravity was a constant. It's no longer a constant for you. Now I'm not doing that for every group, but when I see that some groups are starting to coast, they're kind of like, I got this. We just give them a little nudge, a little twist, right? A little bit of that kind of, so that they're always kind of, there's always this kind of cliffhanger. Or you give them a sequel. They do this project on the wolf, on the wolves, or on the sea otters. And they're all done and they're like, this is great. And the next day I come into the class and I'm like, we got this problem with rhinos. We got a new situation in which the golden eagles in the Ultima Pass out here in San Francisco are dying because of the wind turbines we put on. So we have this great renewable energy source, but we're killing all these animals because they're flying, they're hunting, looking down and they run into the wind turbines. You have one hour with a new group of students to figure out the solution. And I want you to tell me how this problem is similar and different to the problem we just looked at for the next couple, the last couple of weeks. That's one day, everybody. I'm not asking to do like a whole new project. Mm -hmm. It might be one period to help kids that are thinking this way to go out here. And transfer sometimes is just that little nudge to kind of move them to that place. So that's a little bit around problem and project-based learning, how we can bring rigor in with relevance, what some of the research is saying, what some of the myths have kind of brought us into this place where we're like, ooh, I'm excited about it, or this part has always scared me. And then just a couple of strategies to, to think about as you go into the summer or the end of your school year uh, to consider. And I really appreciate you taking the time uh, to, to be with me tonight. Um, but I'll, I'll pass over to Isaac for any other questions and then we'll- Yeah, yeah. and I, I have to say, even after having talked to you and read your work, that last example just really hit me. That like blew my mind <laughs> of taking that shift 
I was kind of familiar with the idea from you, but something about it right now just really drove home with me, like how we keep them in that learning pit a little bit. Mm. Like, okay, you nailed this, but <laughs> the real life happens this way. Right. Uh, and a lot of people put, you know, things about like they love how, you know, learning's messy and we, we stick with it. Uh, and uh, yeah, Amber said, love the twist at the end. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. A couple of people saying, hey, we're buying your book right now, which I do recommend. Uh, you. And, you know, I have no vested interest in him selling his book, <laughs> but it is powerful. My interest in people buying this book is that it will shift what you do with your kids and it will give you that guidance and that clarity up front. Uh, and we do ask people, we got a couple questions like, hey, will this be available? We always share this on our YouTube. Uh, I'll get it up, if not tonight, uh, tomorrow. And we would love it. You share with your, uh, you know, your learning community out there, your network. Uh, and please keep sharing questions, thoughts, uh, anything with us, you know, even after this. And we'll get back to you. I've got a big one for you. And just so anybody out there knows, None of these questions are planned. <laughs> so everything we're throwing at him, he just right on his feet, we've been nailing it. Uh, but I've got a specific one for you. So we've got somebody out there who is really digging into the omnivore's dilemma. I don't know if you're familiar with the book, uh, but I don't know yeah. that you need to be familiar with it. But uh, Michael Pollan, right? Yeah, it's yeah, yeah, uh -huh. yeah, yeah. Yeah. So seventh, eighth grade kind of group age, if you're thinking about that, what might be your starting point during their last unit of the year working virtually? So I'm really, I'm hammering you with this one, <laughs> but just knowing a little bit about the book or even not knowing necessarily as much about that book, but like, how would you maybe take that into some project based or problem based learning in the last month they have maybe of school? Uh, yeah. So not to put you on the spot, but go. No, no, it's good. <laughs> um, so I, 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 I think I've read it too. I don't remember the exact premise. Um, the, the end result is essentially he comes up, he comes to the conclusion, not to spoil it, I think those kids are listening, but basically like we need to eat, uh, we need to pay attention to what we eat. Uh, we need to eat mostly plants uh, and that we, we have this dilemma of like, how did we actually evolve and how did our gut biome evolve what does that have to do with how we live in the world and how we make choices about what we eat? Yeah, so a very I think- poor summary. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I think I'm with you. So um, I think what I would do is I would give kids four or five dilemmas related to this book. Mm -hmm. So give them, give them, don't give them one situation. Give kids four or five different situations. And the way I would probably start it is like, so you have your class, pick a, pick a, put them into cohorts and say, this cohort's gonna look at this dilemma, this cohort's gonna look at this dilemma, this cohort's gonna look at this dilemma. Have them look at that and say, what do you notice about this dilemma? And then what I would do is I'd actually then put them into groups where there's one student from each of the cohorts that come together and say, what, are we what is the common theme around all of these dilemmas? Mm. So that the students can actually walk away with that or walk away from the intro to say, it seems like there is a tension between the things that we eat and what that means in terms of our health and what that means in terms of the health of our plant, right? Like there's probably something general. And then what I would say is, all right, students, so what are the key questions that you have? Which I would assume would be, so when you, if you remember back in the slides around transfer, the questions we're usually trying to get students to ask is like, when, where, who, should should we be eating as much meat as we do? Who is responsible for moderating or modifying the amount of food that we eat? Who should regulate the food that we have? Is it us? Is it my responsibility? Is it the responsibility of the government, right? Which could then bring you into like Fahrenheit 411 and you know all sorts of like cool <laughs> things out there, right? But I think that's how I'd start it. Give them some situations right up front and then read the book. Go through some of the core science behind it. Go through some of the governmental policies or whatever the standards are behind that really dig in and then at the end of that come back and then what i would do the, tw the twist at the end is i'd give them a brand new dilemma so i'd say you know what are we gonna do for our school next year what do we do for for our vulnerable communities what do we do for you and your family like and give them a new situation right at the end that kind of pulls that all together i think that could be interesting one of the things that i would throw out is i'm a huge fan of perspectives so i you know flipping perspectives so i would 
I would throw something out at the end. Like I think the twist and turn might be who's making the other argument and why mm -hmm. is that important? Because mm -hmm. you want to make sure you're checking biases. And like, I'm, I mean, I live in San Francisco, like Michael Paul, he, he lives in Berkeley, like huge fan of what he's saying, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, but simultaneously, it's really important for me to know that there, not everyone agrees with that philosophy and I need to weigh and, and see the other side of that. So I think somewhere in that project, I'd throw a little twist like, all right, we're going to look at the flip perspective. And we're going to debate on that a bit uh, and then, and then come, come to some kind of uh, conclusion at the end. Awesome. Thank you. You nailed that. <laughs> Ooh, stuff. Keep me on my toes. Yeah. I'm uh, picking up a new copy of that book and uh, <laughs> I'm reading it with this mindset. Uh, no, great point from Norma, like take this product public once you have it and that makes it live in the world. So uh, we know some of you may have to hop off as we wrap up. Uh, we want to thank you so much. We're going to share a couple more opportunities. Uh, please join us at thecorecontributes.com for free virtual ways that you can learn. Click on through for me. Uh, we are, oops, <laughs> I messed it up, but we're pumped to have uh, Nathan Langrod <laughs> joining us uh, next month on the 18th. That's my bad. I threw the wrong slide in there. Uh, our marketing team did that right. Uh, we're so pumped about this author and inspired series. Star Saxteen, our editor uh, over at uh, uh, our publishing company is really doing a great job with this. We've uh, already got one up for you, and Barb's is coming out very soon. Uh, Donnie's been nailing that. We've got uh, Core Chat coming up. Uh, so join us every Tuesday, 6.30 p.m. Eastern, and we'll be on there with you. You can click on from that. Uh, always a variety of topics. I'm super pumped about these lunch and learns. We're always looking for people to share your thoughts and ideas, so reach out to Isaac at the Core Collaborative if you have something you think educators need to know. These are bite-sized, five, 10 minute quick session that we put out every Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday on Facebook. Uh, so check those out, great way to learn. Uh, and we're also excited about our uh, group coaching on Facebook, 8 p.m. You can join the awesome Hacking School Discipline team. Uh, they've got a vibrant interactive group to talk about how can we uh, you know, empower students to take control of themselves and their actions. Uh, Paul Bloomberg, our fearless leader, who I hope is not watching because he's supposed to be celebrating his 50th birthday, uh, lead the impact teams group. We're doing that on the core collaborative page, variety of topics, all focused on student ownership of learning. And of course, our amazing star sex team I mentioned earlier, uh, 11 a.m. Eastern uh, on Fridays in the teachers throwing out grades to really shift grading to either being standards-based, uh, you know, or even getting past the grade and, and just getting into to feedback that works. You can click on uh, to that, the core communique, our blog every Monday and Thursday. Click on for me, Michael, thank you. Uh, podcast, if you're like me, you get out, do a little yard work, get out to walk or jog. I like to listen to something. <laughs> and sometimes at the end of the day, I can't see this, I can't look at the screen anymore, so. Check out Podcast Central for those options. Uh, and then uh, we have this great new program we're so proud of and excited about, but Clarity for Teaching and uh, Virtual Teaching and Learning. So please join us online, learn a little bit more about that. You can click on, uh, and it breaks down how to do a lot of what Michael's been discussing right now. How do we develop that classroom clarity, that agency, evidence-based feedback to double the rate of learning, and of course, keeping in mind always, but especially now as we shelter in place, the social and emotional learning uh, and that recognition of people being human beings, not just human doings, uh, while we're virtual. Click on for me. We've got two more. Uh, this is how those sessions work. We can tell you more about that another time. We'll click on. Uh, and I love this. When success criteria came to my life, I was so much better. I was so shocked at how it helped me. That's from a real kid. Uh, and that's why we need that clarity that Michael expounded on uh, so beautifully. So join us at clarityforlearning.com. And then I think last but not least, uh, we, I think this is the last one next. Yeah, we hope you'll keep in touch with us. Here's ways you can keep uh, abreast of what our amazing network is doing. And we would love for you to tag us when you share the great things you're doing. And tag Michael when you're, you know, jumping into some rigorous PBL. Uh, whether it's virtual or maybe blended as things come back together. Uh, any last words from you, Michael? 
No, I just, uh, thanks so much, Isaac, for the opportunity for everyone jumping on today. And um, just give me a holler if, uh, if I can help in any way, shape or form and, and with Core Collaborative. So thank you. And he means it. Reach out to him and he'll, he'll get back to you. Uh, we thank you so much, Michael. This has been wonderful. And to all of you out there, as always, thank you for sharing your two most valuable uh, commodities, your time and attention. And we will see you next month.